you and um, Vince Warren, um, Secretary of SAI, if you're right, I wish, uh, um, of CCR, um, uh, here today. And, um, and, and before we go into Vince, Vince is not the only CCR person that will be here today. Professor Catherine Frankie's um, Racial Justice Litigation Workshop will feature um, Omar Farah, staff attorney at Center for Constitutional Rights, and Alia Hanna Hussein, Advocacy Program Manager, Guantanamo Justice Initiative at Center for um, Constitutional Rights. So if your appetite is whetted, um, now you can go to room 701 at 420 um, and get the second course. Um, so the Visitor from Practice um, series um, is one of SDI's most special programs. It honors a lawyer who has used his or her legal education to make a significant difference and provides an, and provide an excellent role model for current students. The visitors present the talk um, on a matter um, of urgency and interest to them and then meets with students, faculty, and staff afterwards. I'm thrilled that Vince Warren, the executive director of CCR, agreed to be the spring 2018 visitor. Now, I thought I knew Vince really well. We served on the board of directors of CCR for many years, ending in the early 2000s, and we've stayed in touch um, since then. But when I Googled him to find some facts and dates, um, the first thing I found was the Vince Warren slip-on sneaker, <laughs> whose, quote, bold bumper sole boosts a street chic sneaker in a sleek spot at sporty silhouette. Oh, God, I thought. But then my second thought was, well, Vince and the staff at CCR are being unbelievably creative in their fundraising <laughs> efforts, and the sneaker kind of sounds a lot like Vince to me. But then I looked a little bit further, and it turns out that there's another Vince Warren. But it really was plausible for a minute. Let me tell you why. As the executive director of the Center for Constitutional Rights, Vince is at the heart of its fearless and groundbreaking litigation and advocacy work on many U.S. and international issues, including using international and domestic law to hold corporations and government officials accountable for human rights abuses, challenging racial, gender, and LGBT injustice, and combating the illegal expansion of U.S. presidential power and policies such as illegal detention of Guantanamo, rendition, and torture, and that's what it did in the past. Things will talk to you about more current efforts. <clears throat> He's also very thoughtful about how to work with young people and other individuals and communities who the law is not a very meaningful concept and it certainly doesn't provide a comforting source of enforceable rights. And that also didn't just start this year. Some of you may have seen or heard Vince in his media advocate role, which includes being a frequent guest on the Melissa Harris Perry Show, The Reed Report, and Up With Chris Hayes. Appearances on Moyers <coughs> in company with Bill Moyers, Democracy Now!, and more. His writing has been featured in the New York Times Room for Debate on Huffington Post, CNN, on Cobb, and of course, in his Twitter. Prior to his tenure at CCR, Vince litigated civil rights cases focusing on affirmative action, racial profiling, and other criminal justice reform at the ACLU. He started his legal career as a criminal defense attorney for the Legal Aid Society in Brooklyn. Vince is the recipient of far too many awards for me to mention them now and still leave time for him to speak to you. So no wonder SAI told Vince to speak to you as the visitor for practice at a time when being a lawyer, working for social justice, indeed the whole legal and political system seems to have spun out of orbit. And next steps are more uncertain than ever. So I am very honored and very grateful to hear from Vince Warren. Uh, it's wonderful to see, see you all and to be here, and I'd like to thank the SJI for inviting me uh, to address you all. Um, I would very much uh, commend to those of you who are in a, here at Columbia to check out the program this evening. So think about this or as an appetizer and think about that program as a course, or if you are, if you guys are probably cash poor, so think, don't think about it as the appetizer because that's probably all that you eat. Think about this as the side dish um, that you would get, and think about that as the other side dishes that you would get. Um, it's 
wonderful to be here, and I, you know, it's, I am shocked, but not surprised at the state that we are in in this country. I am shocked in the ways that many of you are shocked. Um, trying to get my head around the question of uh, what do we do with a president that um, has not only no regard for the truth, but uh, constantly and consistently and uh, always makes up uh, just completely false things that sends people into a tizzy. Some of us that are concerned about democratic principles, other people that are concerned about um, their roles in Congress. It's a terrible, terrible situation, but that's the shocking part. But what is not shocking, um, and is, what is not shocking and not surprising, is that we found ourselves in a role where uh, we have a president that has gained, and we have essentially given him, uh, more power than we've given any other president before. And over the last, uh, I don't know, 50 years of CCR's history, we have been talking about the question of presidential power, speaking less about who the president is at the time, but talking more about what's at stake in terms of uh, the, the rights that we give away, the power that we embed in the presidential function, and how we feel about that and what we're going to do about that. And in my two decades in the work, um, in combating that question, I've come to the conclusion that no one does it alone. And that means no human. That also means no organization does it alone. So anybody that is feeling right now that either they are the solution to the problem or there is one organization out there that is solving the problem, I invite you to think about the we instead of the me for a second. And it's important to think about this in the context of the work that we do to transform society. And it's not dependent just on individuals, but it's really dependent on us as a community. Whether that's as a legal community, the communities that we come from before we came to law school, the communities that we will go work in after we leave law school. But it's important to think about us, of us, us as a community. Um, and that includes learning lessons for us, from the people that came before us, from the people who we work with now, and from the people and more importantly, from the people that we will be working with in the future, our future emerging leaders, uh, many of whom are going to come from this room. And I've learned that there is deep wisdom that we possess in our community, that when we listen to it, when we nurture it, when we align with it, we become more powerful. We become much more powerful. There's also wisdom that's just derived from expertise. That's the wisdom at some level that we have here. Um, these are people that know how to organize massive they know how to speak to legislators, they know how to deploy the law, they know the ins and outs of the political machinery, they know how to shift the debate through their words, and they know how to motivate people to take action. There's also, importantly, wisdom that doesn't always happen in law school, and that's the wisdom that's derived from direct experience. Those who know exactly what's been wrong for decades in their communities, in their schools, because they went there and their kids go there. These are the people that know the abject terror every single day of sending their child to school when their child wears a hijab or wears a kufi. These are people who know exactly what's wrong with the police department and the criminal system because their family members have been beaten or killed by the police or they themselves have been locked up unjustly <laughs> because they have waited for emergency services and never came. And those who have gone to meet with legislatures and seen that deadness in their eyes as they demand public services, public attention to the plights that they've been suffering for so long. And then there's the wisdom of awareness and the wisdom of action. And that is the, the wisdom of being so upset, so angry, so frustrated, so plain pissed off about what's happening that we are spurred to action, to step out of our day-to-day -day existence, our day-to-day -day lives, step out of uh, doing, uh, of doing your reading for your classes, uh, spending time with your family, and decide to move to be publicly counted and conspicuously there so that human rights abuses will not happen ever on your watch. And when all that wisdom comes together, the wisdom of experience, the wisdom of oppression, the wisdom of action, we are at our most powerful and our most alive. And that's when social change happens. But we have a problem. The problem that we have is that all of those strategies around social change and social alignment and moving forward the needle 
um, under previous administrations. It is all under threat. And it's under threat from a variety of different ways. One way to think about it is uh, we've been under the new presidency for 50 some odd days. And um, this has never happened before. The thing we are experiencing now from this presidency, from this White House, has actually not happened before in our lifetimes, certainly. The 50 days of Donald Trump feels like eight, foot, eight years of George Washington. It really does. I, there's no hyperbole there. That's actually how it feels. Uh, we are in a situation where it's not just the erratic, and narciss erratic nature and the narcissism of the president. It is also what underlies that presidency. If you think about uh, what the values are and what that White House is trying to push, there is blatant ethno-nationalism that is becoming a part of the currency of the executive branch of the United States. And we might have seen that in various ways before in different administrations going all the way back to Richard Nixon, but it is particularly potent, it is particularly virulent, and we also have an executive um, who I personally feel is relatively unaware and unconcerned about the ethno-nationalism ethno that is underlying the presidency, is more concerned about uh, his visibility as a leader. And when you combine those two things, uh, we have at least two different targets to shoot at, which is a, a new thing. We also are in a situation where um, many folks who have relied on uh, the three, uh, the balance of the three branches of government to check each other. We have the executive, we have the legislative, we have the uh, judicial, judicial branch, where um, at least under the Obama administration, a number of people, a lot of groups really were focusing on the legislative branch to move forward certain changes, to push back certain kind of things. And we're in a situation now where we can't rely on the legislative branch to do much of anything to <laughs> the power of this presidency. If you manage to sort of dip out of your books to watch any of the, the confirmation days of uh, you know, Neil Gorbachev's just the discussion about spying in, uh, in Russia, it uh, doesn't take very long to realize that uh, what I think they call this uh, very partisan um, engagement. Um, but partisan is not really the term that really applies. What we're talking about here is we're talking about two sets of folks within the legislature that are vying for political power of their parties. And at some level, they're willing to make compromises as long as we allow them to do it. And so the Democrats will very often, when they're not in power, say to us when we demand that they take certain actions that are important to us, they'll say, look, there's not a whole lot we can do. We're not going to win this fight. We're not going to win these votes. So we need to think about compromise. The Republicans say the same thing to their constituents um, when they are not in power, except that the Republicans have a better fight instinct than the Democrats do. And the reason why that is is because ultimately they're not fighting about the policies and the effects on people. They're fighting about values. They're fighting about core values that essentially uh, create the conditions that communities, uh, that those of us who are pushing for social change uh, for, uh, that, that they suffer under. And so we have a scenario where the Republicans will fight to demean us and fight for repressive uh, uh, policies. And we have a situation where the Democrats will want to start playing by the rules when they start losing. And then when they win, when we have a president like Barack Obama, who did a lot of really wonderful things, um, we also find ourselves in a situation of then trying to work with a president like Barack Obama to make change happen, as opposed to push against President Barack Obama when the change that we need isn't happening. We went through eight years of this. So George Bush, George Bush, and, and this, is, this, this relates to, to the legal paradigm, which I'm going to get to in a second. George Bush uh, was an ideologue. Barack Obama, at some level, was an ideologue. But the difference was that George Bush claimed tremendous presidential powers by bringing men to Guantanamo, by declaring that torture was a policy by which the United States would be extracting information, uh, by having secret black sites all over the world where people were being tortured by holding information um, and over-classifying information so neither we as people or as lawyers or the media could get at them. That was, in, in essence, what he was moving forward. And CCR, recognizing that that was the problem, fought back really, really hard. And we fought back in ways that other nonprofit legal organizations 
organizations were afraid to at the time, reflect that in ways that uh, people that align themselves with the democratic establishment uh, were concerned about because it was going to make them look unreasonable. Uh, we started having discussions with our own allies about the wisdom of pushing for what they would call rights for, for terrorists and what I would call pushing back against the evisceration of our rights that is being applied in this particular case of people who are to be accused of terrorism. And we had those discussions for eight long years under George Bush. And then when Barack Obama became president, um, everything changed. You remember, you, oh, probably you don't remember, but there, Hillary Clinton, who was um, a candidate not just since last time, but the time before, said, you know what, the thing about Barack Obama is that you listen to him and it feels like you know the clouds are going to open up and the rainbows are going to come down and everything is going to be fine. And that was her campaign pitch about Barack Obama. It was a little bit prescient, prescient because what ended up happening is after Barack Obama won, most of the people, a lot of the people on the left felt like the clouds just opened up, the rainbows are coming down, everything is going to be fine. And there was this really interesting cognitive dissonance between the policies that President Obama was moving forward that, was disrupt, that were disruptive um, and people's perception of President Barack Obama as uh, someone who was an agent of change uh, for things that we all believed in. A cognitive dissonance. We knew that it was happening, but we thought it was more important to support him in terms of what he was trying to do than to push along some of the things that were really deeply important to us. So how that manifests, just as an example, is um, we are here now 50 days after um, President Trump has been elected. The island of Guantanamo yet and still is not closed. We don't think about that. Feel like we have other things to worry about than the island of Guantanamo, but let me tell you why that's not the case. Uh, President Obama, I met with President Obama in 2009, and um, I will say that this, that uh, easily one of the smartest humans I've ever met. Um, certainly one of the smartest humans to be in the White House in a very, very long time, and we had this interesting discussion about Guantanamo, and he said to me, listen, I understand why this is important to do, but he pointed behind him, he said, Capitol Hill, I've got all of these uh, legislators that are not going to allow me to do this. So I have to be smart about this. And I said, well, what about the human rights perspective, the international human rights violations that are being happening? What about the constitutional rights violations that are happening? What about um, the, your legacy with respect to Guantanamo? He actually got a little salty with me. Um, and he bristled a little bit. And he said, listen, I'm the president of all of the people. So I have to think about these things differently. And I push the point that your legacy ultimately is going to hinge down the road on how you handle this particular question, which is one of the largest human rights um, violations, so certainly in the US. Um, in <coughs> he didn't do it. He didn't close it. He made political calculations as to where he was going to put his political energy, and it was not with respect to Guantanamo. He did. Uh, outlaw torture uh, with respect to the military branch, and he has not put anybody back in Guantanamo since. Uh, Guantanamo has dwindled down. We have very few men that are there now from a total of 779, and so the pragmatists amongst us might be tempted to think, well, it was a lot worse than it was. He did it the best that he could, and this is better than nothing. All of those things might be true, but it's actually not better than nothing because the base remains open. And even though no one has been brought to Guantanamo uh, during uh, President Obama's tenure, the question for us is what happens when President Donald Trump sends somebody to Guantanamo? Now, that is more than just sending a prisoner to a prison. What that is doing is reopening the entire building the entire 15-year legal battle about Guantanamo to this new audience. It is going to be your challenge and your problem over the next 15 years to be able to find a solution to this problem. And I would beseech that you not try to approach this in a way that is trying to ameliorate the system that is Guantanamo, but I would beseech that you approach this in a way legally that is going to once and for all shut down not only that base, but the idea that the President of the United States can send people to prisons and to places that are outside of the rule of law, because that is really what's at stake. And 
why does that matter to us? Because um, President Trump is really not bound by, I'll call them uh, the, the ideas of decorum that we all rightly or wrongly expect of the president. We know how he treats foreign leaders. Uh, we know how he treats previous presidents. We know how he treats the media. We know how he treats the, the people, that, the communities that we come from. We know all of that. Um, but what is going to happen is that we will see at some point, and it may not be an executive order, we're going to see at some point um, a terrorist attack, an attempted terrorist attack on this soil. And the first thing that they're going to do is they're either going to move that person, the accused person, to Guantanamo or into a military system here in the United States. This is not unprecedented. This has happened before. The Supreme Court has dealt with these issues. Lawyers have fought these issues. But it will happen again. And I want to say this to you. This is a part of the social justice lawyering piece. If you don't learn anything else, I would, I would offer this to you. Over time, the judiciary becomes much more, becomes more and more comfortable with the specter of presidential power. So if you litigate the same issue over a period of time, while you might have great success because of the shock value in the beginning, if it happens over a period of years, you will find that the judiciary becomes less and less interested in the rights of the detainees and the rights that are at stake, and become more interested in the flexibility of to be able to do what they want to do. This happens, this will happen. So we started off in one time with great victories. Uh, we, we ended in the legal program with courts not feeling that there was so much for them to do. The same thing will be happening in the, um, the Donald Trump era. So that's, a, that's some of the problems that we have. Um, but there are ways for us to be able to move through some of these problems, uh, both inside and outside of the courtroom. And I want to give you a couple of thoughts uh, about this from from CCR's perspective. Uh, from the perspective of thinking about just pure presidential power, uh, one of the important focus points for social justice lawyers is to understand their role with respect to the status quo. What do I mean by that? We in law school are trained primarily to be attended to, if not the fierce guardians of the status quo. We have plaintiffs, we have defendants. We have two sides of every argument. In the context of how we're trained to argue that, we have to anticipate the other arguments. We have to make um, the clearest, most compelling case based upon existing law um, as to why our side should prevail. That is not, if you were going to create a groundbreaking strategy to create social change, you probably wouldn't come up with that. So that's how we're being trained. So what does that mean for us? Does that mean that we're all sitting here and being completely satisfied with what's happening? Absolutely not. But it might mean that we're a little bit stymied about how we would reconcile how we're being trained now to be in the legal field and the work that we feel that, that needs to be done outside of the legal field. I see some heads nodding. Some of you have been thinking about this. Um, I don't have the magic bullet. I just have a bottle of work. But I'll tell you my thought. The status quo is the death of change. So if lawyers are in the status quo, lawyers become the death of change. What do I mean by that? I'll give you an example. Um, in 2010, I believe it was, there was a New York, 2009, there was a New York Times article uh, where Leon Panetta, uh, who was in the Obama administration, uh, let slip so that there was a kill list, a targeted kill list. These are, these are people that are terrorists, they don't live in the United States, these are all people that we're going to take out by drone. And it received not a whole lot of fanfare at the time because the drone program had been, you know, preceding Barack Obama. But what was new about it was we didn't know that there was actually a targeted list. On the list of people, amongst the people, there, were, there was an American citizen that was on that list. Now, this posed a big problem, right? You could frame the problem as a constitutional and international human rights problem. How can you have a list? of people and that include US citizens that you're targeting for what's essentially an extrajudicial killing. Um, you can think about it from the perspective of asking what is the government saying that these people are doing. One of the people that we ended up representing was a man named Anwar al who um, spent a lot of time on YouTube, a lot of time on YouTube, talking about uh, death to the West and that type of thing, but it was really confined to YouTube. Um, and so you can ask yourself, 
respect to, to international law, is saying things like that to the U.S. and other really horrible things uh, enough of a legal justification for, for any government to be able to take that person out? The answer, of course, is no. But that's what was embedded in that New York Times article. So what does that, what does that mean with respect to the status quo? Uh, we, at CCR, immediately saw a problem and we wanted to mount a legal challenge. And it, as part of that calculation, some organizations think, well, if we mount this legal challenge, are we going to do more harm if we lose, or are we going to do more good if we lose? And that is a status quo mentality. Because the answer to that question is if you feel that your instinct is that you're going to do more harm, then you do not. And if your instinct is that, you're, if, that the only way to change things is to win, then you're only really taking the strategies that you feel in your gut are likely to be able to prevail. And that leaves the field, leaves that area with a range of strategies that are untried, that are untested, that might be necessary and might build an amount to um, a pushback against a bad policy. So the way that we thought about it was, there's no way that we would be likely to prevail on a challenge to uh, President Barack Obama's drone policy with respect to Anwar al -Rabi. Largely because of the nature of the controversial figure that Anwar al rabi was. So why did we do that case? Why did we file that case? Well, we filed it because at CCR we have a very long saying, and actually require all staff at CCR to get this tattoo. Um, which is called Success Without Victory. And the idea of success without victory is if you define your trajectory in social change only through legal victories, then you are narrowing your ability to help the field move forward. You are essentially less helpful by defining your work that way than you would be if you defined it differently. So what does success without victory look like? We filed the, the challenges, and actually the ACLU and CCR filed the cases together. It was the first time we worked on a case together. Uh, might be in the history of the two organizations, but certainly in, in my tenure. And we filed those cases, um, and uh, we, we argued the cases we didn't get past, uh, we did, we, the case was ultimately dismissed. We had a discussion about whether we appealed it or not, but the case was dismissed. But here's what happened after the case was dismissed. Um, all of the groups that we had approached there were many, I'm not going to go through the names here, but if you think about for the human rights people in the room, think about your dream legal job in the human rights field, we approached that group. And we said, <laughs> hey, we need support for this because this is a, a violation of international law, it's a violation of constitutional law, and we need big ground support for this push. And a lot of these organizations had questions, and the questions were around the whether it made sense to curtail presidential power in the way that we might, or meddle with presidential power, or even inquire about presidential power in the way that these cases suggested. Would that be more helpful? Would that be more hurtful? So none of them, zero, came along with us for that particular ride. Uh -huh. <laughs> After the cases were filed, no, no one had been talking about a U.S. drone policy. All of a sudden, in Congress, there was a vibrant debate about U.S. drone policy. Um, there were, during the filibusters that were happening, uh, there were Congress people that were filibustering, reading CCR's material about drone policy. Uh, there were Congress people that were emboldened around that question. And then the human rights groups began to deploy some of their staff to look at the effects of drone warfare on the ground. All of a sudden, <coughs> we, there was this broad-based coalition against drone warfare. So it, some of the organizations get there first, other of the organizations get there later. It resulted in what we were looking for in litigation. It was fairly tepid. We were looking for the court to be able to review in camera, if necessary, the legal justifications for the drone program. I mean, it's really, you know, we weren't asking for the crown jewels. I mean, that's about as tepid as you can get. We still lost that. Um, but all of the fanfare and all of the discussion prompted something within the administration to leak the legal justification for drone warfare. So <coughs> sometimes if you move forward in a way that almost defies <coughs> the sense of status quo, you can generate results from the community in ways that you might not have anticipated. So the 
end result was we, those were made public, um, and that everybody was able to see them and discuss them. A range of human rights groups were deeply involved and carry that work on today. So it's important that we, that you, not think about the status quo as your primary strategy. It's really thinking about what is the bust out move, what is the risk that I'm going to take as a lawyer that is going to make the situation better on the ground. There's another piece that I think is really important for us to talk about, um, and that is the difference between public interest lawyering and movement lawyering. Public interest lawyering is the lawyer, lawyering that many of us do, and I'm included in that. Um, movement lawyering is a subset of public interest lawyering, and it has a very special set of skills. It takes a very special way to think about your lawyering, and, and, it's, and it's actually one of the key drivers of social change, and it's something that they don't teach in law school. So here's what it is. Um, if you were filing a case, and uh, let's think about let's think about if we were going to move from here and we were going to go out into the world and we were going to file litigation with respect to any manner of the stuff that's coming from the Trump administration. If you filed a case, and if you look around you in your pleadings, in your thinking, in your uh, in in your press conference, if there are not real people that are not lawyers that are around you, what you're essentially doing is rearranging policy chairs on the Titanic. What do I mean by that? Movement lawyering is not about having the lawyer going up and saying. This is wrong. Uh, we're going to spend all of our time arguing points of law in courts. Movement lawyering is about partnering with the people that are the most deeply affected by the policy and incorporating their strategies, their suffering, into the litigation. So that if you win the litigation, that you're winning, you're creating a win for the people that are the most affected. And if you lose the litigation, that you are still advancing some of these really important aspects that the people that have come to you have, have, have done. So an example of that has been our stop and frisk litigation. So CCR uh, litigated the stop and frisk case. We won the case in 2013, and with a searing ruling uh, from the uh, district court, the Southern District of New York, that found the stop and frisk policy violated both the Fourth and the Fourteenth Amendment of the Constitution. There was great fanfare. It was great nine and a half week trial. It was terrific. What you don't know is we didn't file that case a couple of years before 2013. We filed that case in 2000 and, no, sorry, 1999. In 1999, we filed that case. And the reason why we filed the case in 1999 was because uh, back then there was a man named Amadou Diallo, who was a, an African immigrant. He was here in New York. Uh, very much like the Freddie Brown, uh, the uh, Freddie Green killing and the Michael Brown killing um, that we experienced in 2014, it caused certainly a citywide up uproar. And this man was an immigrant. Um, he was in his building, in the vestibule of his building. The police came up. There was a special unit that they weren't wearing uniforms, and they just used to beat people up all the time. Uh, he was in his unit, in his, in his uh, outside of his house. And the cops came with their guns drawn, hit on the floor of the whole thing. And so you know what he did? He did this. The thing that you could never do as a black man, went into his, wallet, into his pocket and pulled out this, his wallet. Why would he pull out his wallet? Well, because think about it. The man was an immigrant to the United States. He's assuming that people are asking for his ID. And for that, they shot him 41 times. So if you're a Bruce Springsteen fan, if you heard the song 41 Shots, it's about that incident. From that incident, there were massive uprisings in New York City. The people were getting arrested at police plaza. People were over at the UN. There were marches all up and down the street. And a group of organizers, community organizers, came to CCR and said, this street crime unit that shot Amadou Diallo has been a huge problem in our communities. Is there some litigation that you can craft to be able to disband or at least push back on the street crime unit? And that's actually how the Stop and Frisk case was born. We filed that litigation in 1999. It was litigated until uh, 2002. The city came with a settlement. They disbanded the street crimes, by the way. They came with a settlement. And as part of that settlement, we asked for a, an anti-racial profiling policy. And they said, sure, we'll give you the anti-racial profiling policy. Here it is. It was a one-pager. Done and done. We were monitoring that case for a period of six years. And during the period of this, between the time of the settlement and the time of the monitoring period being done, stop and frisk rose 
600%. And why would they rise 600%? It was actually because of 9-11. 9-11, massive amounts of funds are pouring into police departments all over the country, very much like we're going to be seeing with this president, who is going to be massively deploying funds to police departments around the country, to ICE around the country, to even um, tribal police around the country, when law enforcement get that amount of money and that amount of backing from the federal government, terrible, terrible things happen. So my point there is that the stop and frisk case, although when you tell that story backward, it begins to look like an heroic effort that all of the pieces were in place and all it really took was a smart lawyer or two to come and file the right uh, constitutional challenge to a policy that everybody thought was wrong. But when you tell that story going forward, it's actually about deep embedded, embeddedness in movement organizing and having the lawyering connected to that. And so I want to talk a little bit about telling the story forward and telling the story backward. And I think this is one thing that I've learned in my, in my time in, in, in law, in, in doing this work, is that I, like very many of you, had idols. Before I came to law school, I developed idols. When I was in law school, I was like, oh my god, I so want to be like this person and Professor so-and-so. If I could only do that, it's mine. And that is all great, and that is all good, and you should continue that, because that is the most limiting thing in the world. What I've learned is, after meeting some of these folks and talking with some of these folks and incorporating some of their suggestions into my practice, is the answer, the answer to the question of how do you do this is a constantly evolving so for those of you that are circling around the millennial generation and are thinking that there is some concrete structured answer to the question that you're asking and you're really frustrated because the institution isn't giving it to you, I would suggest that it actually doesn't work that way. Every step forward, when you, when you think about a case, when you think about a case backwards, right, it's very clear, it's not the first case, best thing that happened in New York City policing in a very long time, I think so. You tell that case forward, it was filled with a lot of questions and a lot of, of really hard decisions about how the case should be structured, who we would be partnering with, what we should be highlighting, what we shouldn't be highlighting. I'll give you an example. One of the things that we could have highlighted, that I wish we had highlighted, it was a great opportunity to, but we did not, was the role of gender. How stopping frisk and policing is a gender phenomenon. Right? We, I, fell into the idea that this was about white police officers and black men in the community. And it was, and remains about that. But there was also a deeply gendered piece of both police aggression and I think in terms of the way that police officers interact with folks. So why am I, why am I confessing it to you? But I'm confessing it to you because when you tell the story backwards, it looks like it's perfect. But when you tell that story forward, you will always be able to find ways to make your own better, to connect it to some of the issues that people on the ground are seeing, and I think importantly, connecting it to things that people are not seeing. And that's the thing that people can't tell you. And that's the thing that you don't learn from sitting in this room. That's the stuff that you don't learn by sitting in front of your computer in the job that you were running. That's the thing that you learn <coughs> by being out in the world with real people. So if you find yourself holding a press conference and there are no real people around you, you might say, this is going to be a learning moment because my litigation could be so much better and so much more powerful and so much more meaningful if I were to incorporate um, some, of these, some of these elements into the litigation. Um, we'll talk about strategy versus tactics for a moment. Uh, if you knew that your house was on fire right now, you'd be thinking, Where's my partner? Where are the kids? Who's got the cat? One of you would probably be thinking about, I have that box of letters that I didn't show my partner, or I want to keep that box of letters, I want to get them out of that. I'm trying to get stuff out of the house. That was a little idea. You want to get that stuff out of the house. That is tactical thinking, and it's very smart tactical thinking because you need to get yourself out. But if you thought about, if you knew that your house was going to be on fire three months from now, you would be thinking only strategic. It's not about where's the cat right now. It's about how do we prevent this? What are the things that are likely going to cause this that we can, um, I can sort of deal with right now? What is my plan for notifying people? Who, and when you think about it strategically, very often, 
it involves other people than just you. And that's the area that we always have to deal with and we have to deal with in this Trump administration. So I want to say to you that as you find yourself right now at this moment saying, I need to do something, what am I going to do? What are we going to do? You go on Facebook and your friends are just following this horror show of opinions and thoughts and you're kind of checking out a little bit because you're like, I can't handle that, I have to do my work, but still, what am I going to do? The answer isn't always, what am I going to do tactically? The answer is, what am I going to do strategically? It's <coughs> um, there are tactics that present themselves to us that are the result of deep strategy. So some of you may have found yourself at JFK Airport friends that went to JFK Airport uh, to show up as lawyers to be able to help people um, uh, after the first Lansing ban um, was, was put into to effect. And you might have experienced that as a tactical moment. I hear that stuff is happening there. I'm going to go there and help. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. And that is really, really valuable. And it's that energy that gets you into the space that is the most important thing that, that you can do. And it's actually a gene that a lot of lawyers lack, right? Something is happening out there. Lawyers say, what, what, what do we think about this? How, what, what does that mean? I'm not really sure that I see a cause of action here. Let's talk about it some more. Um, right, that's what we do. So that tactical thing that gets you off your butt and into action to see what's happening is a very, very good thing. I want to say, though, that we shouldn't mistake that tactic for lack of strategy. Because in order to be able to build a program where massive numbers of people will show up, and that you give them something to do, and you organize it while it's happening, that is strategic. And groups, immigrant groups in the US, in the New York City, have been working towards that moment for years, <coughs> even though they didn't know that moment was going to happen. And when they were able to say, let's do this thing, people came, and they were able to, to uh, be able to make a chaotic situation one of deep solidarity deep resonance and deep meaning. That is something that lawyers can do and lawyers can be really good. But you have to be thinking about what's the place that we're going to need to be. Who do I get? How do I get people there? And what do I have them do? Two examples of, of how that, of how the, the strategy becomes important. I want to tell you one is Guantanamo and one is Ferguson. These are CCR. Um, uh, Endeavors. The Guantanamo endeavor, uh, we talked a little bit about that at the top, but here's what really went down. CCR was a very small organization, um, and we were the first to file the habeas corpus challenges. Nobody wanted to do those cases. We went to the Supreme Court in 2004, Russell versus Bush. We won Russell versus Bush. Um, and then all of a sudden, there were these rights that the court acknowledged that then created an obligation for lawyers. Number one, nobody's ever been to Guantanamo before. You don't even know who's down there. You know that George Bush brought him there. You know that he's holding them in and not going to the court. You go to the Supreme Court and you win rights for uh, habeas corpus detainees of whom you've never met and whose names you don't know. When the court says, yes, there is a, a right under the Constitution, or the, the, the government has violated the Constitution, what the heck do you do next? And what you do next is, number one, you figure out, okay, how do we get down there? And so CCR was also uh, had the first lawyer. Um, she was the first lawyer to go down there and meet with clients at one time. And then number two, there are 779 lawyers. How do you get other lawyers down there? So we created what, which was at what the, at the time the largest pro bono um, legal <coughs> mobilization in in U.S. history, as far as we can tell. Where we recruited over time 600 lawyers, largely from large law firms, uh, to go and represent them in one time. So there was an opportunity. There was a it developed into there was a tactic that developed into a strategy, and the strategy then brought more people in, so that we then had 600 lawyers against the government's lawyers, and we were able to collectively to get you know 700 people, more than 700 people out of Guantanamo. Ferguson, the same thing on a smaller scale. Um, in Ferguson, things were jumping off. There were organizers that were in the street. Um, things that you may not know, number one, these were not professional organizers. These were people who lived in Ferguson all of their lives, many of whom 
left their jobs at the CVS. Uh, another person I met was a, a dental assistant. Another person I met worked in um, a bookstore. They left their jobs to be on the street all the time, protesting and resisting the police violence. They were getting tear gas, they were getting beating, beaten, they were getting jailed. We went down with Ferguson, and we didn't go down with a legal strategy. We didn't go down with a tactic. We went down and spent a number of weeks with these organizers to build some trust, and we asked the question, what do you need? What do you need? You know what they said? They said, we actually need to get people out of jail so they can go back on the streets because if you're not constantly protesting, CNN is going to take their cameras home and nobody is going to pay attention to what we're doing. Strategy. So what we did was we created, uh, along with the National Lawyers Guild and a number of other groups, the Ferguson Legal Defense Network. And we deployed and brought about 250 volunteers to do legal, uh, not, legal not just legal observing, but to do jail defense. And what did that look like? Um, the police have very interesting tactics. Um, and this, this, this happens all the time. When people get arrested, so Ferguson is part of a ring in St. Louis County that actually is outside of St. Louis. There are about 90, 80, 90 jurisdictions in, in uh, St. Louis County. So when you get arrested for protesting in Ferguson, they would send you to a city jail in another jurisdiction. <coughs> so people were actually in jail all over the county and not just in one particular place. And so that was the first thing we learned. And so the strategy was to have lawyers and organizers deployed at each of the jails just to be able to get the main information that they needed there. That information got sent back to a central group that was formulated, that was farmed out to lawyers who were barred in the state of Missouri, um, who would be able to then do legal action to be able to get people out of jail. So the networking piece that, the strategic networking piece that we provided was not about filing that big case that you're going to read about in your casebook. It was about creating a, a network of lawyers to be able to do very useful things to be able to advance social um, action. So there are a lot of things that we don't know about this administration. And there are a lot of question marks about what they will do, about how they will do it, about when they will do it. And in some ways, that can feel stultifying. It can make you feel like, I'm just not sure what I can do. And I want to get back to the I am. And so the worst way to think about social justice is thinking about what I can do. The best way to think about social justice is to think about what we can do. And what I mean by that is um, whenever, whenever there is a call for lawyers and law students to go somewhere, to support something, that is not the, that is time when we make personal calculations. Is it going to be safe for me? Da -da -da, da -da -da, that's legit. But you should never start making legal calculations about whether it would be of value for you. There is an intrinsic value in our profession. People love it when, well, not everybody, but people in the movement world, people love it when lawyers show up to support movement. It makes them feel like there is part of an established group of people that can do something that are supporting them. So number one, go. The next is going to happen. The next time that you, you see some of these activities for lawyers, just go. Grab a friend and go again. Just check it out. You will make networks and connections with people that will start building your ability to be more useful as time goes on. You will develop a reputation of someone that works collaboratively with other folks so that as ideas formulate about what to do about the next Trump crazy, that you will be a part of that discussion. And you may be in exams, and you may have other things to do, and you may have a part-time job, but being part of that network is hugely important. Number two, um, you can and should avail yourself of recruiting anybody, other lawyers and other law students to move with you and start really concretely discussing building your network <coughs> in the social justice sphere. If we took everybody in this room and we mapped it out in kind of a Facebook sort of way, we're connected to mostly everybody, in, at least in one or two ways for me. And that network has to uh, coalesce. And it is actually coalescing because the more uh, egregious the regime is, the more people really want to come together. So networking is really kind of key. Three, I want to give you a, uh, I want to give you a thought about the type of protest work that you should be engaged in. This is going to be a little controversial, but here we go. Ferguson 
Baltimore standing rock. In Ferguson, Baltimore standing rock, these are people who were deeply affected by government action that were taking a stand saying not gay rights immunity, and they were calling on people to come to their community and support them. As a result of doing that, they were heated, they were tear gassed, they were opposed, people lost limbs, people died. Why? Protest is a sentence is a foundational part of the United States. And so is racism, <coughs> and so is patriarchy, and so is giving special permission and special status to people with means. And so anytime that you have a march where people are coalescing around racial justice and patriarchy and against um, corporations or entities with means, it is not going to be the peaceful Christy March that we saw in Washington, D.C. It will be met by hoses and dogs and horses and guns and tanks, all the more so with this administration. Why am, I, why am I saying this to you? I'm saying this to you because the safe protest, it's great to be in a safe protest. I went to the safe protest, took my kids to the safe protest. The safe protests are they galvanize millions of people. It sends a really important message to this government, whether they acknowledge it or not. But the unsafe protests are the ones where our democracy is actually in the balance. It's the one where lawyers are the most needed. It's the one where people are taking the most risks. It's the one in which the crackdowns will be really, really hard. And it is true that if people didn't resist in Standing Rock, and if they didn't resist in Ferguson, and if they didn't resist in Baltimore, we might have never known about any of it. Any of it. And part of what I learned from the people in Ferguson is that that resistance, like that real resistance, requires a continuing flow of human engagement. And that <coughs> continuing flow of human engagement needs to be in spite of the risks. And I learned much about what I know about social justice learning from two law school, uh, Columbia Law School alums. One is Arthur Pinoy, he's the founder of the Center for Constitutional Rights and is my constitutional law professor at uh, Rutgers Law School. The other one is Michael Ratner, who is the leader of the Center for Constitutional Rights for many, many years until he died uh, last year. And what I learned from them was the idea of being on the front line with the people that have the most to lose, the most to risk, is the place that a movement lawyer has to be. So that leaves you all with some choices. Not necessarily life choices, but it's a question about your trajectory. It's a, it's a question about your safety. It's a question about your security. It's a question about what you want to risk. And with respect to risk, I will say this. Social change has never happened without risk and it never will. You cannot escape from slavery without taking a risk. You cannot cross a border without taking a risk. You cannot decide to transition in junior high school without taking a risk. You can't go to school in the middle of America wearing hijab without a risk. And people do it all the time. Every single one of those folks that are taking a risk are under attack by this administration. The question for us is, what's the risk that we as a legal community is going to take? Not in any sort of just a solidarity, solidarity kind of way, but if we are really the guardians of all that is near and dear about what the law can do, then how can we do that if we're not, at some level, taking risks in the way that the people who are the most um, agree the other thing that Michael and uh, um, Arthur taught me was this other thing, which is that justice is possible. Like there is a, we, you may not feel it at this particular moment, or when, particularly when you look at Facebook, oh, that's okay. <laughs> but if you don't believe that justice is possible, how can you possibly expect anybody else who is relying on formulate strategies to believe that. So you have to go in 
thinking that I don't know what the strategy is, I don't know what the lawsuit is, I don't know what my role is, but I know that justice is possible. And my being here is going to make it more possible than it was for my being here. Anyway, thank you all very much.